The Lord is risen. He is risen Good morning. I greet you in the Savior. In the name, I greet you in the name of our Savior on this beautiful day. I, for the record, I checked my rain gauge this morning at six, three point four nine inches, and that's just since midnight because it resets at midnight. So we've had lots of rain, and obviously continue to do so. So anyway, I greet you in the name of our Savior Jesus on this wonderful day God has given to us that we can be here in His house and doing our worship thing here. Uh, if you turn to the middle of your bulletin, just a few announcements that I want to share with you. Um, school starts Thursday, right? <laughs> I'm getting a very sad look from somebody there in the third row. Um, so we'll be doing the, black, the, the backpack blessings uh, next Sunday. Um, so for those of you who are either a student or an employer, employee of a school, uh, we will be uh, uh, blessing you guys at both services next week. A reminder that we're still uh, reading the Bible every day, and if you uh, want to, you can turn in your chapters. It looks like we're going to hit 10,000, and that's a very good thing. Um, men's Bible Breakfast will be this Saturday at 8 a.m. We're going to be doing session three, I think, of uh, who am I and what am I doing here. Um, Rally Day will also be next Sunday, and so after church, we will be having our annual in the church picnic, unless by some happenstance it's like 65 degrees next Sunday, but I wouldn't count on that. Um, but anyway, uh, you are invited obviously to be here with your presence after second service and also to bring a side. The main course, the drinks and such will be uh, provided. And of course, it is our tradition, I should say it's your tradition, to have homemade ice cream and to rate those and to contest which one is the best. I say that's your tradition because even though I am from Wisconsin, I do not eat ice cream. So, uh, I've told you that before. And uh, every time I say that, I see you guys looking at me going, really? But that's true. And Erica just says it means more for her, so it works out at our house just fine. Uh, F3 is going to start up again on September 4th. We're going to have a wow night the, the last Wednesday of August, reminder of that. Um, and I think, oh, and one other thing, I don't know if you're aware of this, but our friends over at Holy Trinity at our daughter congregation, they are installing a new pastor today. Uh, let's see, what's his name again? Paul Hemingway is being installed over there at 3 o'clock. If you guys want to attend, uh, you are, uh, we're all invited, okay? All right, anything I'm forgetting? Uh, in terms of birthdays today, Delaney Duncan has a birthday tomorrow, Ellie Drum on Wednesday, Aaron Williams on Thursday, and Jackson Lovelace and Levi Williams on Friday. So uh, happy birthday to all you folks. And I do not see any wedding anniversaries here. Is that correct? Okay. All righty. Then let's go ahead and go to our first hymn this morning as we uh, begin our worship today. Jesus comes today with healing, and God bless our worship together this morning.
congregational police stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You open your hand. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Gracious Father, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Grant that Christ, the bread of life, may live in us and we in him, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for today is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The epistle today is from the book of Ephesians, with the verses out of chapters 4 and 5. This I say, and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put in the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The congregation will please stand to sing the Alleluia in verse, and we remain standing for the words of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate, man, ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our sermon hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for your sermon this morning, the biblical basis for our thoughts together today, are the words of the Old Testament reading, which Russell read a few moments ago, the first book of Kings, chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. So I'm beginning today with something that I believe most of us, if not all of us, have experienced at some point or another in our lives. I believe this is something that most of us have in common. Because I believe that most of us have at some point, we've gotten fed up, annoyed, irritated with our jobs, our families, the news, with something that at some point we have said, whether it's out loud or to ourselves, enough. I have had enough of this, whatever this is. I'm done. Okay. Now, I can tell you that I felt this way trying to pass linear circuit analysis back in college, a long time ago. I didn't, by the way. I felt this way working at that uh, country radio station in Midland, Texas, when I realized that all of my bosses were crooks, and I'm not exaggerating, that is not hyperbole, the station manager and owner, the, the uh, programming manager, the sales manager were all guilty of felonies, payola and misappropriation of funds and stuff like that. And meanwhile, I was getting paid less than minimum wage because they said, you're getting a salary of 9000 a year based on a 36-hour work week, but we need you to work two extra hours when you're not on the air to do your commercials. So I actually had a 48-hour work, work week even though I was getting paid for 36. Okay. So at a certain point, I had enough of that. So when they, when they fired me, I wasn't exactly heartbroken, let's put it that way. And uh, then there was the fact that uh, Erica and I felt this way when Christopher turned two. Now let's recognize that Christopher just turned 22. And Erica and I have forgiven him for what I'm about to relate to you, but we have not forgotten. Because Erica and I felt this way when Christopher t turned two and still was only sleeping two hours at a stretch at night, when we were awakened every two hours, every night, for two years, we had had enough. And, and then we had another kid, yeah. So. <laughs> Thankfully, Matthew didn't have that kind of sleeping habit. But Well, in the text today, Elijah has had it. Yahweh, God, has just given him what any faithful prophet would call the greatest triumph, and it may have been one of the greatest triumphs, or the greatest triumph in the Bible for a prophet, okay? And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about here, it's what happens before the text today. In chapter 18, Elijah is sent by God to Mount Carmel. He assembles all of the Israelites there on this mountain, and he says, okay, we're going to finally put it to rest. Who's God, Baal or God? And if you're not familiar with Baal and Asherah, which is what the Israelites were worshiping, uh, that was a fertility cult. And I'm not going to explain what that is if you don't know because we have young ears here. But let me just say that there was a lot of fertility in going on if you worshiped Baal. All right, do you get my meaning? And so God was really upset with the Israelites for turning his back on, on him and worshiping Baal. So the deal was the prophets of Baal, there were 850 of them. They set up an altar, put a, 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 a bull on it, and they call out to Baal and ask Baal to burn the sacrifice, all right? So for hours, they're uh, praying, and they're yelling, and they start beating themselves, and after hour and hour, nothing happens, and eventually Elijah starts trash-talking these guys, and I think it's the first recorded uh, episode in history where trash-talking happens. And I can't tell you what Elijah said because let's just say it was very earthy language. Your Bibles do not translate precisely what Elijah said into English because no one wants to read that kind of talk in English. But anyway, so Elijah's trash-talking the prophets of Baal and eventually Elijah says, okay, stop because nothing happens with their altar. And then Elijah builds his altar and puts the bull on it and dumps enough water on it like we have out there right now and he looks up at heaven and says, okay, God, set fire. And before he can even complete his prayer, fire comes down from heaven, devours the bull, the altar, the waters, boom, this, it's all gone. And all the Israelites standing there go, wow. And they start saying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. 
And Elijah says, okay, I've got Israel confessing God. Take those 850 prophets and we're going to kill them all. And they did. So Elijah goes to bed that night having one of those days that pastors like to have where it's like, okay, God is on my side. This was awesome. This was great. And it lasted till the next morning. Because when uh, Ahab informs Jezebel, who is the queen, she was the one married to Ahab, the king, and she, by the way, was the one who personally funded all 850 of those prophets because she was a devoted follower of Baal and Asherah. So Ahab says, uh, Elijah killed all your prophets. So wicked Queen Jezebel, when Elijah gets up that next morning thinking life is good, she says, not so fast, my friend. And I throw that quote at you because college football is coming up. If you, you, if you know, you know. Not so fast, my friend. Not so fast, Elijah. By tomorrow, I'm going to see that you're as dead as the prophets you had killed. And so Elijah ran. And he may have been the first ultramarathoner. If you are not aware, you know, a marathon is 26.2 miles. But there are people out there who run 50-mile road races, 80-mile road races, 120-mile road races. They're called ultramarathoners. And yes, they're a little weird, but they do that. And there's actually a gal in Oklahoma City who is one of the premier ultramarathoners in the country. Running marathons for her is too easy, so she, now she runs 120 miles at a pop. Okay? But Elijah may have been the first, because he ran out of the country, he ran out of the next country, and he ran out into the desert. And when he stopped and got his breath back, he prayed, it's enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. Elijah says, I've had enough. Now, before we continue, I have to explain a little Hebrew word for you here. It's just one word. This is only one paragraph. This will not take long. But you need to recognize that the critical word for our purpose in this text is the Hebrew word rav. It's just three letters. And this short word is translated in different ways throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes it's many, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's abundant, sometimes it's numerous, sometimes it's multitudes, and sometimes it's enough. And this is an abrupt beginning to Elijah's prayer, this word. Because he does not say, O oh Lord, our God, King of the universe. He does not say, Dear Lord. He does not say, Our Father who art in heaven. Instead, he begins this prayer with this single word. He just says, Enough! But it conveys the sense of our English phrase that you've heard more than once in your life. I've had it up to here. I've had enough. Okay. So Elijah in his prayer to God after running and running and running away from naughty Jezebel and please note, you've never met anybody named Jezebel, have you? You've never met anybody named Adolf either, right? Jezebel is quite likely one of the worst women ever in the history of the world. Really terrible, horrible, evil person. So he's running away from Jezebel, who has put a hit out on him, and he tells God, I've had enough. And we can understand why, <clears throat> if you look at it from, from Elijah's point of view. He's endured years of deprivation, isolation, hiding, worry, hunger, knowing he was hunted. He did not live a comfy, cushy life. Because remember, Elijah and John the Baptist were basically two peas from the same pod, right? John the Baptist said, I am the, the new Elijah. So they both lived out in the desert. They both wore clothes that were not designer or, or great clothes. They had an interesting diet because remember John the Baptist ate bugs. He ate locusts and wild honey. So Elijah was of the same ilk. Elijah was never featured on preachers and sneakers. Okay, I see a few of you nodding your heads. A lot of you looking at me like, what? There's a guy on Instagram who features pastors preaching at these megachurches around the country wearing sneakers that cost $1,000 or more. Or, you know, sometimes he'll estimate that what the pastor is wearing is, you know, like $3,000 worth of clothes. You know, these guys that wear designer clothes. So the name of the, the Instagram is Preachers and Sneakers. And, and by the way, these shoes cost me 100 bucks. The pants I'm wearing were $39 at Kohl's. I'm not going to be featured on Preachers and Sneakers, okay? I'm, that's not going to happen. Okay. But anyway, Elijah did not lead a cushy life. 
And we also note this morning that to everyone else, you know, he, he seemed like he was strong, wise, confident, successful, because whenever he stood in front of the people, he was saying the word of God. But to himself, after that great success that God gave him, he, he knew it wasn't him, but that great success that God gave him the day before, the next day he seems like, he feels like he's a failure. And so he says, enough. And this is how he begins his prayer to God. Now, this whole idea of I've had enough, I've had it up to here, these sort of, this sort of idea is very common in our culture. There are, 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 my favorite example of this is with Peter Finch in the movie Network, and this movie was back in the 1970s. If you don't remember the famous quote from that movie, I cannot say it from this pulpit because it's language that pastors should not use, but if uh, you want to know what it is, I can tell you, uh, well, I guess I can, I can edit it. I'm mad, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Okay, that was the line from that movie. Okay. Much of the music we hear on the radio, the smartphone, the YouTube, expresses the theme, I've had enough. Whether it's lost love, loneliness, your dog running away, your pickup truck rusting, these things show up in the list of our miseries. And yes, I just made a country music joke. Because of the old joke, if you play the, the typical country and western song backwards, your wife, your dog, and your truck all come back to you, right? Now, by the way, country music did not invent this kind of song. In 1662, a guy named Johann, and I think this is pronounced all, his name is in your bulletin of the hymn we just sang. He wrote a hymn to honor a teacher in the city of Leipzig. Now, think about this. 1662, this guy's going to write a hymn in honor of a teacher he knows in Leipzig. Now, the teacher must have had a rough life because the hymn is based on what Elijah says here where he says to God, I've had enough. The title of the hymn is, is Es ist genug, which means it is enough. I spoke a little German there, clears the throat. They'll help me hear the rest of the sermon. And the verses list the reason that the singer wants to die. So here's what Here's the hymn about this guy in Leipzig, all right? It is enough. Lord, take my spirit. His griefs are gradually tearing me apart. The poison of sin has all but smothered me. Nothing good dwells in me. Uh, he says, the, the cross that you've given me almost breaks my back. How heavy, O oh God, how, how hard is this burden? Many nights I soak my hard bed with tears. How long, how long must I yearn? When is it enough? I really hope as school starts here this week, we don't have any teachers that you know or in our school system that are feeling this way. Probably have a few students that are thinking along these lines, but hopefully no teachers. But this cheerful hymn is not in our hymnal. But I suspect the idea is familiar to you. Because you too have sometimes felt that the burden was too heavy. And the, the hymn that he wrote in 62, 1662, it ends with a little hope, but like Elijah, the author must wait for God's deliverance. Now, when it comes to this song, there is a happier ending, because somebody named Johann Sebastian Bach, I assume you've heard that name before, he took this hymn and he did his thing, and so that is now in our hymnal. We just sang this hymn, S.S. Canuck. Bach rewrote this hymn, and it's in our hymnal. The words have been changed from, oh God, I am in such misery, to an Easter hymn. Okay, it's now an Easter hymn. And this Easter hymn is a hymn that celebrates the gift of life that Jesus has won for us, and now we are content. Okay. Well, let's get back to Elijah here. For Elijah, it was sad seeing him so unhappy and spent that he, he tells God, kill me. But that didn't happen. Elijah was sustained by the angel of the Lord in the desert. And sometimes, and I think it's the case here, when you see the phrase angel of the Lord, that's actually Jesus before Bethlehem. Okay? So God did some baking, and the results were miraculous. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that have energy bars. And if you go to Crest, which is where I shop, you'll see like 30 feet of these energy bars in one aisle. They just go on and on and on, you know, five shelves, lots of different things. Um, and so for all the companies out there making energy bars for people who run and ride their bike and whatever, uh, they would love to have the recipe God used because you'll notice that uh, Elijah had you know, two of these pieces of bread, loaves of bread, dinner rolls, whatever they were, and on those two pieces of bread, 
he walked 40 days and nights. Right? So Elijah was given enough to go on with his life, although all his problems were not immediately taken away. Elijah was revived. He rebooted, if you will. He went back to work, but he did not see the final fulfillment of his hopes. Not here, anyway. Not until the whirlwind took him to heaven. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought Elijah was taken into heaven on a chariot of fire. And, you know, there's two people in the Old Testament that said they never died. They went straight to heaven, Enoch and Elijah. Well, in a few chapters here, Elijah and Elisha are walking along, and they see a chariot of fire go across the sky, but it says he was taken to heaven. Elijah was in a whirlwind. Okay. Now, I am no Elijah. You are no Elijah. But I wonder if we know how he felt. To all those sitting around you, I'm thinking you too, may appear confident, put together, responsible, much like Elijah looked. Remember, we talked about that two pages ago. But how do you see yourself after years stuck in the same job, after all this time striving to make ends meet, with the long list of troubles that you could name, but you don't want to sound like a complainer? The fulfillment of God's promise that Elijah longed to see, was, has, it's reserved for you. And, but yet you may experience the same sense of despair. You may have the same long list of troubles. When we work hard, but we don't see the results we want to see, we can, be, we can become discouraged, just like Elijah did. For instance, maybe you've had a problem in school. Here's another college story for you. For some reason, I'm thinking about school since school is starting this week for many. Uh, when I was in college, I was taking calculus, and it was not going well. I had a professor that talked like this, and he had this big chalk stain right here, because he keep wiping his hand off here, and he could sit there, and the, the you know, f function of f of x like this, and he just talk, and he go, "You guys okay?" And he had this comb over that went from like Chicago to Detroit, you know. So then you you go to your small groups, right, which were two days a week, and uh, my small group leader was a guy named Daniel Lee. Daniel was not his name; he adopted that as an English name. He was from Taiwan. He did not speak a word of English, not one word. So should not surprise you that I, got, I was getting a C in calculus, although it did surprise my parents. And so I got a tutor to help me, and so you decide to buckle down. You work hard, you put your nose to the grindstone, your shoulder to the wheel, and I don't know if our young folks have ever heard those phrases, but when I was growing up, if my parents told me to work harder, they'd say, you need to put your nose to the grindstone, you need to put your shoulder to the wheel. Well, the problem is, how do you feel when you do all that, and after all that effort, all you have is a broken nose, a sore shoulder, and your grade has not changed. In my case, my C remained a C. Now, the next semester, I had a different professor, and my TA was not Daniel Lee. His name was Telemaco Tzatzafratis, and I've never forgotten that man's name. Had, I got an A- minus in that, that semester. But anyway, maybe there's something like this happening to you at work. Your sales are down, your performance reviews aren't as good as they used to be, so you decide to take it up a notch. You kick it into another gear. You work longer hours. You do what the bosses say they want and then some. And so then how do you feel after you put in all that extra effort and then your performance and your sales, your reviews don't change? That can be discouraging. This can happen in church as well. We love the Lord, and like Elijah, we want God's kingdom and our congregation to grow. So we pray. We attend worship services. We, continue, we volunteer to teach Sunday school or to usher. We give of our income. We can do all those things and still not see the congregation grow the way we want it to. But you have received help from that same God who helped Elijah when he revealed himself as a man in the person of Jesus. You know, it's Jesus in his ministry. He never said, I've had enough. But he did come to a point where he said, it is enough. When he had done enough to pay for all our sins, he took them to the cross. That was enough. The work of paying for our sins was finished when he said, it is finished. His work of saving us was done when he died and rose again. And like Elijah, Jesus has fed you with bread that sustains you. Remember last week when I said that God's a really good cook? You have more evidence of that today, that God is a really good cook. Jesus has fed you with the bread that sustains you. And not just ordinary bread and wine, but his own body and blood, the food of healing and life. That's right here. Now, have you noticed that three out of the last four weeks, this has been our Sunday theme, that this, 
the Lord's Supper. This is fantastic. This is amazing. This is something that brings us the strengthening of our faith, forgiveness of our sins, and eternal life. We also know that God is a good cook. And so our complaints and our disasters and our problems are transformed into a song of resurrection victory, just like that song, It Is Enough, that I told you about. We can stop saying now, I've had enough. Instead, we can say, I am content. Just like the hymn we just sung. We can tell God, I've had enough, but Jesus comes to us and he gives us more than enough. Elijah, the great prophet, cried out in his hopelessness, enough, but now, because Jesus died and rose again for you, because he took away your sins, you can now say to God, it is enough. I am content. In the name of Jesus, amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, please bless and receive these gifts which we give back to you from that which you have first given to us. Amen. We now stand and confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Today he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you sent your Son to be the bread of life, giving eternal life to all who come to him. By your Holy Spirit, lead the whole church on earth to imitate you and walk in your love as beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. Give strength and courage to all pastors and those who assist them, especially those suffering from conflict, burnout, or depression. Hearten them by the example of Elijah and the prophets and apostles before them. Comfort them through the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. And we also ask your blessings on uh, Paul uh, uh, Hemingway, who is going to be installed at our uh, daughter church there at Holy Trinity later today. We ask that he would be a blessing to them and that they would be a blessing to him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers for our nation. Cause us to live in harmony with one another and free our citizens from want, suffering, danger, and fear. Protect our troops, including Thomas, Matthew, Evan, and Chris, Maya, John, Ben, and Debbie, Seth, Christian, Jacob, and Jonathan, Nick, Preston, and Tyler. Lord, in your mercy. Show kindness to the sick, including those who are printed in our bulletin insert here this morning. And we also take a moment and pray silently in our hearts for those that we know to be in need of your grace and mercy today. Never let them be in doubt that you hear their prayers. Relieve all pain and provide for those who suffer from any kind of hardship. Lord, in your mercy. Bless those who commune this day, that reconcile to each other in Jesus Christ's body and blood, 
we may rejoice to receive your forgiveness through this gift. Be strengthened in times of doubt and be nourished in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to be the bread of life. Together with all the faithful who have gone before us, we give you thanks and praise. Keep us steadfast in the faith so that when our last hour comes, we may rejoice with them at the marriage feast in his kingdom, which has no end. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do, in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. may be seated.
Now the feast of the Lord is prepared for the people of the Lord. Come to the feast.
now stand to sing the post-communion canticle. Thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look, look upon you with his favor and give you peace. We remain standing for our closing hymn. Once again, we have come to the uh, end of our corporate worship here on a Sunday morning, so a reminder that, hmm, I guess your sermon was a little longer than average today. I guess I don't have to tell you that. So uh, we'll be back here for Bible class in about 15, 16 minutes, especially for those of you online. Uh, otherwise, as always, God be with you and bless you this day and this week.